Hi everybody and welcome to Kids Club Liberty Lights. I hope you all had a great week. Hopefully you had a great Easter. Wasn't it so good to celebrate Jesus rising from the dead? Thank the Lord that he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and he gives us hope that we can live in heaven with him forever because he rose from the dead. So I hope that you guys enjoyed doing that craft last week. It was lots of fun. I love doing it. I had a good time. I think I might have enjoyed it more than you guys did. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and jump into our kids club because I have been loving these stories about George Mueller and it's exciting to see how God's working in his life. So I want to get to the rest of the story today. So let's start our club with our pledges. So everybody stand up and let's say our pledge to the American flag. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Now to the Christian flag. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Now to the Bible. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Great job. Now let's sing our song. We're going to snap today. Ready? Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. Ye are the light of the world. Great job. Liberty lights, shine bright. Shout it out. Liberty lights, shine bright. Liberty lights, shine bright. I hope all of you have been working hard this week to shine right for Jesus. I know it's a little hard. In fact, I was talking today to a mom and she said her sons are fist fighting. They're getting so frustrated being home, stuck at home with each other all the time. But we all need to work hard to shine bright for Jesus. And let's go ahead and pray. And I'm going to sing a song with you that always makes me smile and makes me laugh. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for this time together that we can sing some songs, that we can remember how you provided for George Mueller and can provide for us. And Lord, we love you so much in your name. Amen. All right, let's sing this one song. You know how Miss Kara loves to laugh. I like to laugh over a whole bunch of silly things, but I love to laugh. And the best thing to laugh about is the joy that Jesus has filled my heart with. And so we're going to sing our song, Ho, 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 Hosanna. So if you remember it, Sing it out loud with me. Ready? Ho, 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 Hosanna. Ha, ha, hallelujah. He, 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 he saved me. Now I've got the joy of the Lord. Ho, 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 Hosanna. Ha, ha, hallelujah. He, 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 he saved me. Now I've got the joy of the Lord. That's a great song to sing. And one other song is I'm happy today. Let's sing that. I'm happy today, I'm happy today in Jesus Christ. I'm happy today for he has taken all my sins away. And that's why I'm happy today. I hope if you weren't happy before you tuned in today, that by now you are getting kind of happy because Jesus is so good to us. And even in the midst of tough times and hard times, we can still find something to be happy about. In fact, right now, while we're having Kids Club, I want you to think, hmm, what is one thing I could be happy about? What is one blessing that God has done for me that I can smile in the midst of craziness? I can still smile. I want you to think about it. And then I want you to text me. Get your phones, get your mom's phone. Hopefully you don't have a phone. Get your mom's phone or your dad's and ask them say, this is what I am happy about. This is what God has blessed me with. And I want you to send that to me in a text message, okay? And so wait till we're done so my phone's not dinging during our, thing, our uh, lesson. But send me something that you are happy about, that God has blessed you. I am so thankful that God 
does supply for us. He saved me and he takes care of me. And so we're going to sing that song now. Now there's, it's the song about he will deliver me in my time of need, how he takes care of me. That's one thing I'm very happy about. So I'm happy that he saved me, but then I'm happy that he takes care of me. And we've been learning about George Mueller, how God has been taking care of him. You're not going to believe some of the things we're going to learn about tonight, how God took care of him. But this song is one thing that we sing, and it's a fun one. So if you remember the motions, I don't know if I can remember the motions and do the slides and all, but I'm going to do my best. All right, ready? He will deliver me in my time of need. Like those three Hebrew children from the fiery flame. Well, he fed 5,000 with two fishes and bread. And he walked on the water, and he raised the dead. Now he stood by Daniel in the her lion's den, and he saved old Moses from Pharaoh's hand. Open the eyes of the blind to see. Ah! I know that he'll deliver me. Now the reason we scream or holler when we say open the eyes of the blind to see is because you're supposed to pretend you're seeing your crazy neighbor next to you or maybe your brother or sister and ah! It's kind of scary. So make sure that you're doing the motions, the scary lion, and then, ah, or if it's something beautiful, if you're there with your mom, you can go, oh, so whatever you want to do. All right, let's sing that one again. He will deliver me in my time of need, like those three Hebrew children from the fiery flame. Well, he fed 5,000 with two fishes and bread, and he walked on the water, and he Raise the dead, now he stood by Daniel in the lion's den, and he saved old Moses from Pharaoh's hand. Open the eyes of the blind to see, ah, I know that he'll deliver me. I hope you were singing along with me. It's much more fun when you're singing along than just listening to me. Now we're gonna go ahead and start with our story about George Mueller. Now, I think that you all remember the story of George Mueller. And if you can, if you're forgetting some of it, maybe you can go back and watch again. But George Mueller had grown up and he was not a very good man. In fact, he had done some really bad things. I don't know if you remember, he, was, he lied. He was a thief, he stole. He was very mean to his father as well. And so just a lot of things that God wasn't very pleased with him. But God can save anyone and praise the Lord for that. And so he had a friend that invited him to a prayer meeting. And while he was there, he got under conviction in his heart. That means that he felt bad for how he was living and what he had done and that his sin was against God. So when he got home that night, he prayed and said, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I am so sorry. I want to be a new man. And remember those words he said, at last I am yours. And praise the Lord, God saved him, changed his life. The, in fact, we learn about it. His whole life was changed. He stopped doing bad things, and now he wanted to become a missionary. Well, God had to supply his needs because his father wouldn't give him not even one penny towards it. But God did provide and give him work. And George left his home in Germany. That's where George was from, Germany. And he sailed to England. While he was there in England going to school, it just seemed like he worked so hard, hard, hard. And he said, you know, I feel that God wants me to be a preacher here in England, not to go to a different country. I want to be a preacher here in England. And a small chapel, Ebenezer Chapel, in the little village of Tynemouth, they asked him to come to be their pastor. And he said, I will, as long as God's leading me. But if he leads me elsewhere, then I must follow God and trust him. And so sure enough, he became their pastor. While he was there, he met a sweet young lady named Mary. And they fell in love. Mary was a good Christian lady and loved the Lord with all her heart. And George and Mary got married. George and Mary got married. That's fun to say. They got married. And they served the Lord together. And they stepped out and had to trust God for some different things. In fact, I don't know if you remember, but... George had said, I don't want anybody to have to rent those seats anymore. I just want to trust God completely for people to put in offerings and that alone will pay. But it got kind of tight sometimes. And remember that one night there was no money in the box and George thought, oh Lord, how, are, how am I gonna make it? And then the next morning, 
the deacon came and knocked on the door and gave him money. And over and over again, God provided for one whole year. George and Mary had all of their needs met through the Lord. It was incredible to see how God would work. Well, George came to Mary one morning, and that's where our story picks up today. George came to Mary and he said, I feel that the Lord wants us to go to Bristol. Bristol was not that far away, but it was a bigger city and it had a lot of slums or ghettos or poor places. And George had a friend, Henry, Henry Creek, that had asked him to come and help him. George, after praying about it, felt this was where God wanted him to go. Well, Mary, remember where we ended our story last week? Mary said, I'm going to have a baby. So no longer would it just be George and Mary. Now they had a baby. But I'm pretty sure if God could take care of George, if God could take care of George and Mary, then God could take care of the baby too. And that's where our story picks up this week. George had made his decision. He was going to leave Tyneman and go with Henry Craig to reach the people in Bristol. Gideon Chapel was the church they would be working in and it was in the slums. Garbage filled streets of the city were far different from where George and Mary were used to. And even George's imagination had not prepared him for what was ahead. George and Henry soon found that many members of their church were sick. George and Henry had just left the house of a sick man when George spoke up. Henry, Henry, listen to me. That man in there, his skin was yellow. I know, Henry said. He did look rather poorly, didn't he? No, you don't understand. I've seen that look before. When I was in London, Henry, that man has cholera. Oh, cholera was a dreaded disease. It had already spread through London, causing an epidemic. So many people had gotten sick and died. Before either of them could say another word, they heard it. The funeral bell. The church bells were ringing the funeral song. Cholera was now in Bristol. All that summer, the bells tolled again and again. That means they rang over and over again every time someone would die from the disease. Inside the church, the people prayed for deliverance. George and Henry saw more than ever the need to tell people about Jesus because no matter what, people needed to hear the gospel. People needed to hear the hope that Jesus had to offer. Despite the epidemic, they continued to visit the sick and the dying to share the hope of Jesus. At home, Mary was almost hysterical with fear as George prepared to go out once more with Henry. George, please don't go. You didn't come here to kill yourself. What can you do anyway? Well, Mary, we can pray. I know, George, but you've already prayed every morning for two hours you pray. But nothing stopped the epidemic. Even when up to 200 people, members, join you at the church, it still hasn't stopped anything. I know, Mary, but no one from our church has died. But we have a baby. I'm so afraid. George took Mary's hand. Mary, the only thing to calm our fear is the Lord. Together they knelt in prayer. Dear Lord, George began, we ask for your protection over us. Even if we should die this night from cholera, our hope and trust is in the blood of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. George soon hurried down the street as the funeral bowl bells continued to moan across the city. Finally, months later, the epidemic was over. From the Gideon Chapel, their church, only one member had died. George and Henry led their church in a special service of thanksgiving for God's protection. George and Mary had even more to be thankful for. Their baby had been born, a little girl named Lydia. She was healthy and Mary thought she looked exactly like George. Life in Bristol was just becoming normal. 
when one day George was out walking around the street deep in thought about what God would have for him and Mary and their future. Hey, sir, hey, how about giving me some money? The voice startled George out of his thoughts. From behind a big iron fence, a boy smiled at him. How about some money? A shilling? Just a little bit, anything. The boy stretched out his hand, pressing his dirty, grimy face up against the bars. George reached into his pocket for a coin, and he realized he was next to an almshouse, a poorhouse. The boy was an orphan. That means he had no mother, no father, no family. George thought back to where he lived when he was in Germany at the seminary. It was an orphanage, Frank's orphanage. But unlike that one, this building before him seemed sad and dark. Suddenly wild, maniacal laughter <laughs> echoed from the building. It grew louder and louder, then choked off. Then it started again higher and wilder. What is that? George said a little frightened. The boy shrugged. Just some old loony bird, don't be scared. Crazy people live here too with us orphans. Now where's my money? Whew, what good would one coin do for this boy? George dropped it into his hand, his heart broken. This boy would grow up here caged with crazy people, lunatics and criminals. George Schilling, George Mueller slipped him a single shilling, a coin, and then walked away. When he got home and sat down to supper, his heart was still burdened. That night, he told Mary, Mary, I believe that God wants me to start a day school. Not like one of the other free schools. This one would be only run by Christians. George, how can we do this? We don't have any money. I know, Mary, but we've seen God provide in so many times. I know he could take care of this. I want to teach the children about the Bible, teach them about education and, and reading and numbers, but I want to teach them good Bible teaching that would help get them through these hard times in life. George, be honest, how much money do we have in this house? They both knew they only had one shilling left to their name. As much as they had just given away to that little boy, that's all they had left themselves. <sighs> George knew he had to pray. It was a radical, crazy idea to start this college, but if it was God's will, God would provide. He got his friend, Henry Craig, to pray with him to see if the Lord had it in his plan for George and Mary's life for God to provide. And Henry knew as well as George that if God wanted it, God would take care of them. That night when George and Mary sat, one night when George and Mary sat down to dinner, George prayed. God, I know you want me to start the school, but if I don't get money soon, I'll have to give up the plan. I, If I could maybe just, Lord, I pray for 20 pounds. That's how they counted money in England. I pray for 20 pounds. That's a lot, but I could use it to buy Bibles from the children. It would be a start. He finished his prayer and they began to eat. Well, later that evening, a knock came to their door. Outside their door, it was a woman. She handed George an envelope. I'm sorry it's not more, Mr. Mueller. George opened the envelope and began to count. Five, 10, 15, 20, 20 pounds in this envelope? Man, what do you have planned for this? Did, did you have something special that you wanted to donate this money to? The woman hesitated. Well, it, it might be a strange idea. Okay, go ahead. But what I had in mind was Bibles. 
George couldn't believe his ears. She left, and when George closed the door, Mary came running from the kitchen. I heard everything, George. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry I've had such little faith. I've been wrong. God wouldn't have sent the money if it wasn't his will. I should have known he would provide. He's such a good God. Together, George and Mary knelt and prayed in thankfulness to God for what he had done. Soon, they established their day school, and it was filled with children, poor boys and girls throughout all of Bristol. They came to feed their stomachs with a little bread and then hear Bible lessons to fill their souls. But there became, they began to have a problem. It seemed as just when a young boy would begin to understand his sin and his need of a savior, he would get taken off to a poor house and was never seen again. Oh, we have to do something, George said to Mary. But what, George? These children have no parents. The poor house feeds them, gives them a bed. What can we do? We're not running an orphanage. Hmm, no, we're not, George said, but maybe we should be. Now, orphanages were a radical idea in England. There were only three in the whole country of England and none at all in Bristol. But the idea stayed in George's mind for the next several months. He kept praying about it and couldn't get it off of his heart. During that time, Mary's missionary brother had returned and was making plans to go to Germany. He asked George to come with him to be his interpreter. Now, it had been six years since George was there. When they got there, they drove to George's old seminary. His professor, Dr. Tholuck from the university was still there. And while he was there, George asked him if he knew of an old friend he had. Where is he? I'd love to catch up with him, George said. Oh, I'll take you to his room tomorrow. He's staying at that Frank orphanage. You know, the one you stayed out for a while. I think he might even be staying in the same room. At least it's the same floor you used to live in. George couldn't believe the coincidence. He'd come all the way back to Germany to have the Frank Orphanage brought back to his mind. God, are you trying to say something to me and direct me? As he went back to Bristol, God continued to direct George's thoughts. One afternoon, he even had dinner at a widow's house from his Gideon Chapel congregation. While he was there, he looked, he was looking at some books on her bookshelf and there was a biography of the man who had founded the Frank Orphanage, the one who had stepped out by faith and let God provide. George had already read that and it seemed like God was impressing on his heart more and more the need to start this orphanage. By the end of the week, George went to visit his friend, Henry Craig. He sat in his study. Before saying a word, George began to pray, Lord, you know my heart. If this isn't from you, please show me through Henry. Help him to direct me, give him wisdom that I need to hear. And George began to explain his plan. Henry listened carefully as George laid everything out. Henry, we could get one of those big cheap houses in the middle of the slums in Bristol. There'd be plenty of room for 20 or 30 orphans. We could clothe them, feed them, educate them. Most of all, we could teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he loves them. Well, what about money, Henry said. Well, we'll do the same thing that God's taught us to do personally. We'll ask him to provide. Henry raised his eyebrows. You mean we don't ask anyone for money? Right, Henry. You remember how during our cholera epidemic, our people trusted God to protect them, and he did. Yes, but this is money. And then what happened after the epidemic ended? People just went back trusting themselves, trusting in man's ways. What's your point, George? The orphanage is the point. Henry, if I, a poor man, step out by prayer and faith, if I receive what I need to establish, 
and the people see how God provided, there's something visible that the Lord can use to show Christians and non-Christians that he is faithful and he answers our prayers. Hmm. Henry remained silent for a moment. Then he smiled. I think that's a wonderful idea, George. I feel the Lord is leading you to start this orphanage. From the pulpit, it was hard to tell how the congregation at the church was going to take George's announcement to start the orphanage. He didn't have long to wait to find out. After he announced it and then closed in prayer, a rush of people came down the aisle to meet him. Some were a little skeptical. That's a newfangled idea, are you crazy? Someone else said, that's a harebrained scheme. Some were even opposed. We've got enough alms houses and poor houses for the people. Bristol was fine before you got here. But some actually trusted that God was in it. Here are 10 shillings, Pastor Mueller. It's not much, but it's a start. Another person offered, I can cook and clean. I'll be so happy to volunteer my time. Someone else, I'm wonderful with children. Could you use me to help? George saw in these faithful few the fulfillment of God's promise that he had read in Psalm 81, 10. Psalm 81, verse 10. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. George had opened his mouth wide wide enough to ask God point blank for some specific needs and God was answering those needs one by one. However, George's excitement and joy was lessened by one thing. His wife Mary still doubted. Not long after, a letter arrived from a couple offering their services to George. They even offered to donate all of the furniture they owned to furnish the orphanage. As Mary read it, she said, I don't understand it, George. They don't even know you, Mary said. Yes, but we know the same Christ, and that's enough. 10 shillings, a cook, a couple to help, someone else to help with the children, furniture for the house, and you haven't asked anybody for anything. Mary's voice quivered. It must mean there's only one thing to think. God must want this orphanage. Together, Mary and George prayed again to God, thanking him for what he had done. But now Mary had a believing heart. As they were praying, a bang came from the back door. George swiftly rose to his feet and answered the door. And a man George had never seen before had several bundles and he sat them on the floor. These are for your orphans, he said. And once he unloaded the last one, he left. George and Mary tore open the packages with little Lydia. They unwrapped the contents. There were 28 plates, dinner plates, three big servers, wash basins, drinking mugs, salt holders, a grater, knives, forks. From out of the night, a complete stranger had brought what they needed right to their door. How did he know that very morning George had prayed for kitchen supplies? Only God could have provided for them in this way. In the months that followed, they continued to pray specifically and God continued to provide. They prayed for money and God sent it unbelievable in unbelievable ways one time george was even in a store and the merchant the store owner at first was a little irritated with george because he knew george wanted to start an orphanage but by the time george had left that store the merchant gave him 100 pounds they prayed for clothing for the children and someone showed up at their door with material to make clothes they prayed for helpers and a housekeeper volunteered. They prayed for a house and God provided that too. A large building, huge house on Wilson Street, just like George had imagined. George beamed as he gave Mary the news. 
I am just aching to have 30 children move right in, slide down the stair banister, shout from the attic to the back pantry. By the beginning of February, it was all ready for them to move in. It looked almost exactly like all the other houses on the street, but this one was special. As George swung open the doors of 6 Wilson Street on the morning of February 3rd, he knew it was different. From that day on, there wouldn't be a house like this on Wilson Street, not in Bristol, nor anywhere in England. This was a special place. George sat down at a small table in the front room. The orphanage was now open for anyone to walk in and make application for a homeless child. George soon expected the room to be crowded with applications and people to come in. He sat for about a half hour, waiting, waiting, waiting. He went back and sat for another hour, got up, looked at the, out the front door, nothing. An old woman walked up, continued on past the house. A well-dressed gentleman passed by across the street. By late afternoon, George had to admit the truth. No one was coming. In his mind, he could hear all his critics. Doesn't this prove it? Didn't we tell you Bristol isn't ready for this crazy idea of an orphanage? George sat down at a chair in the front hall. I just don't know. I don't know. Lord, I thought this was your will. You seem to provide in amazing ways. Now, you'll have to send the children. And that's where we're gonna finish our story for this week. Hopefully, some children come. Now we see in this um, story how God provided for George in unbelievable ways. It was incredible to see all of the ways that God, some things George hadn't even prayed about and God brought. Some things while George was praying about, God brought to his door. And it wasn't in ways that he was expecting. It wasn't in ways that he even thought God would do it. But God supplied for George. And God used people to help Mary too. Remember, she was doubting a little bit. She was a little worried. You see, it's okay for us to sometimes wonder. Sometimes trusting God doesn't make sense. We can't really understand how it's gonna happen or, or what God's gonna do or how he's gonna provide, but we still have to trust God. And he always comes through in amazing ways. Just like a stranger bringing them plates. They never saw them before and they never saw them again. Yet that very day they had prayed for kitchen supplies and God used a stranger. An angry merchant that was irritated at George gave them money. You see, God is a wonderful God, a miracle working God, and he provides in miraculous ways. And so what is it? It's just our job to trust him. That's what it is for us to do. Simply trust him, lean on him, depend on him, pray believing because God can do it, even if it doesn't make sense. Our verse that we've been reviewing and going over about, it's pretty much the theme of George Mueller's life. Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If you can read, read that along with me. If not, maybe your mom will help you. It says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. God will supply your needs. God will always take care of his children. And that's a wonderful thing. And God will do it in ways that don't always make sense. So I've got a fun activity that you guys could do at home. Now, it's not something that you have to have adult supervision, but I think it's a great idea for you to ask your mom or your dad first if you could do it, but it's really fun. So you get a sandwich baggie. See, get a sandwich baggie, get some water, and then get three pencils that have been sharpened, okay? And this is going to be a great example of how to trust God when it doesn't make sense. And he does miraculous things. 
George did that in his life. Him and Mary trusted God. It didn't make sense, and God did the miracle. So here's a fun object lesson. I want you to get the baggie. I want you to pour the water in the baggie, okay? And then you're going to close it. All right, close it, close it. And this is where the trust in God comes in when it doesn't make sense, because here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to poke the pencil through the baggie without making a mess, ready? Sometimes God asks us to do crazy things like poking a pencil through a bag full of water. And we don't know if that's gonna work because trust me, when I first looked at this, I thought this isn't gonna work, it's gonna make a mess. And that's a great example of how sometimes God asks us to do hard things or crazy things like George start an orphanage in a slum or a ghetto with no money, crazy things. But God said, if you trust me and you obey and you have faith and just do it, I'll do the miracle. Now, I don't really know if this is a miracle, but it's pretty cool. But God does miracles. And so this is a fun thing. It's just a good object lesson to just show you how crazy things can happen when you do, even when it doesn't make sense. So I hope that you learned something today. I hope that you are going to learn from George's life how we can trust God, how we can depend on him to supply all our needs to take very good care of us. The most important thing we need to trust God for is our salvation. If you've never asked Jesus to save you, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and you're not sure that you would go to heaven when you die, then I want you to call me. I want you to talk to your mommy, talk to your daddy, or give me a call and we can talk about it because the Bible says we can know for sure that we'll go to heaven. And that's the most important step in trusting God is to first trust him for our salvation. And then the rest of it, the crazy things, it's all easy when you trust God. All right, love you guys. See you next week. Are you still? <laughs> okay. Is it not stopping? Okay. I don't know if we can crawl that off. That's because you are. Uh...